Hello and welcome back to Let's Level Up. My name is Rick and we have another tabletop review for you today. We're going to be looking at another Tasty Minstrel game on the channel. This is actually going to be a space deck builder designed by Seth Jaffe and it's actually called Imminent Domain. Now this is going to play uh, in about 45 minutes. Our first playthrough was with two people and we played it in about uh, 30 or so. Um, it's going to do two to four players. The expansion pack is actually going to be able to add another player. And we'll detail the expansion next weekend after this video releases. So uh, first up, we're going to have the expansion expansion to Belfort. And then we're going to have the Imminent Domain expansion. So watch us open the box. We're going to show you some of the components, how the game is played, and then give you our final thoughts. This is Imminent Domain, a deck building game by Tasty Minstrel Games designed by Seth Jaffe. Now, this game is going to be a little bit different than some of the other deck builders out there because it actually lets me do things on my player's turn and that's a kind of uh, not necessarily a completely unknown mechanic to the genre, but definitely one we don't see a lot, which I really like. Um, in this game, we're going to start with a basic hand of cards. Um, we're going to shuffle these up really good and then draw five cards. We're also going to be given one of the uh, turn phases identifier. Whoever gets the card with the red back is the first player. In this case, me. We'll also randomly deal a starting planet to each player. Um, so we'll just do this really quickly, and here we go. Here's our starting planet. There are three types of planets in this game. There are metallic planets, there are fertile planets, and there are technology planets. So one kind of looks like Mars or Mercury, one looks like Saturn, and the other like Earth. Each has its own different abilities and kind of uh, uh, archetypes of what you can do with the planet. The metallic planet are generally very rich with resources other than water. Um, you can get a lot of metal here. Uh, metallic planets are usually uh, easy to, uh, to colonize and conquer. Uh, the, uh, the advanced planets are going to generally give you more of a research and trade bonus. And then the fertile planets are going to be a great way for you to get uh, easy colonies and a lot of different resources to trade with. Now, in this game, we're going to be collecting victory tokens here. Uh, now, the game is going to be over in a two-player game when one of these stacks is completely out or whenever the main stack of victory tokens is out. Now, this condition actually changes with the number of players and actually in increases. So, with two to three players, you'll actually need to exhaust two stacks. Sorry, with three to four players, two stacks. And then the, ex the expansion will introduce a fifth player as well, which we'll get into in another video. There are three main phases in this game. There's the action phase, which I can use to play a card for its action and basically just resolve whatever it says. There's the roll phase, where I'm going to choose one of the five rolls on the board and then perform one of the actions. Sorry, six rolls if you count trade as a separate uh, roll, which you should. Um, and then there's the cleanup phase, where I essentially discard any unwanted cards that I, that I don't need and then draw back up to five. Now this is a deck building game, which means that we're going to be shuffling our deck quite a bit. But let's take a look at each one of the different roll cards independently from one another, and then discuss how the game is going to be played. The first roll card we look at here is Survey. Now Survey's action ability, and again I can do this as an optional phase on my turn, where I get to play a card for its action. So when I play it, I set it on the table, hit resolves, and then immediately gets discarded. In this case, it'll let me draw two cards. Now if I choose this during my roll phase, I get to look at the planet stack and I get minus one planet cards for each survey I have here. If I was the one who initiated this roll, meaning if it was my turn, I am technically the leader. And the leader lets me get one additional card, um, sorry, one additional planet to look at. So essentially you're going to use the survey ability to look at our planet stack and then get more planets here in our empire. The more planets we have here, the more planets we have the possibility to take over or colonize, and that equals big victory points. The next actions are produce and trade. Sometimes planets are going to have a symbol here that's represented by a color. For instance, fertile planets will either have wheat 
or water. Uh, metallic planets have metal. Technology planets sometimes have gases and whatnot. Um, we can actually produce those resources here, and then trade lets us actually trade those resources for victory tokens. Again, a good way to score throughout the game. The research action actually allows us to uh, discard two cards from our hand, so again, get rid of the slough that we don't want, or if we choose it as a roll, we can actually calculate all of these different research cards that we're going to have and buy one of the three major technology upgrades depending on the number of planets that we have. And we'll get into that a little bit more later. Colonize is one of the primary actions that you're going to do in this game. Planets always start with their face down. Um, so essentially you're going to see the back of this card here for every planet that you have. And the planets are going to have two different identifiers on the back. Or, sorry, one identifier telling you the type of the planet and then the cost for warfare or the cost for colonization. When you colonize a planet, you'll take any number of colonized cards that you have and place them underneath the planet that you're colonizing. Once you have colonies that are equal to the number of, or the value on the planet card, such as this here too, you'll actually be able to settle that planet on your turn, either for an action to settle, excuse me, to settle one planet, or um, during your roll phase. So this planet here is gonna give me two victory points when it's revealed, and it's gonna allow me to uh, get the resource of metal. So this is a pretty powerful planet early on. The last card we're going to look at here, sorry, the second to the last card we're going to look at is the Warfare card designated by the crosshair symbol. This actually allows us to get one plane or one fighter, which are represented by these little icons here, and they come in all different sizes, which are really nice, they're kind of fun. Um, these fighters can be used to attack planets, uh, depending on what the role is that you're picking. And uh, you'll either be able to get more fighters or attack planets. If you attack a planet, if you have more fighters or equal to the number of fighters on the planet, you'll be able to take over that planet and again, flip it over to its face up side and then uh, start using that to gain points. Uh, the last card which you'll start off, with, every player will start off with is just an action card and it's the politics card. It says, remove this card from the game and take any one roll card from the stacks and put it into your hand. So this is a good way for you to basically set off what it is that you're trying to do. Now this is going to be a deck building game that really emphasizes synergy. You're not going to want to go over all the actions. If you go warfare, stick to warfare if you can. Um, if you go colonize, stick to the colonize cards because you're going to be able to maximize your potential points depending on that. You're also going to want to make sure you use your research cards throughout the game to be able to get rid of the cards that you don't need. Again, if I'm going Warfare, I want to take these colonized cards, I want to get them out of my hand because I'm generally not going to need them. One thing you're going to notice is that in the Planet deck, it's usually a lot cheaper to get the colonies up than it is the planes, or sorry, the Warfare. However, it's not the case here for this planet. Um, However, fighters can basically sit in a bay outside of it, um, and colonized cards have to be committed to a planet. Um, so a fighter, eventually, I have essentially more uh, opportunities to basically attack and move, attack and move, and then once a planet is taken over, those fighters go back into my pool, um, whereas the colonies cards are essentially going to go back into the discard pile. Um, so it's pretty balanced out that way. Um, you're going to have fewer warfare cards starting off the game, um, but it's, it, again, as you're playing it, it's going to balance out quite a bit. So those are the different cards. Let's show you a sample hand and how it's played during a turn. Okay, like any good deck builder, it's going to start off with us shuffling our deck up really well. Um, I'm sorry, I say really well. This is probably not the best shuffling job out there, but I think it'll do for our everything we need to do. There we go. And we're going to draw five cards and I'm going to take a look at those five cards. So I've got a survey, I've got a research card, I've got two produce and trades and then a politics card. So what I'm going to do on my action phase is I'm going to play the politics action. That politics action I'm actually going to choose to, we're going to get rid of this card and we're going to actually go warfare. So we're going to put that warfare card into our hand. Now we're going to go to the rolls phase. 
So again, on the world's phase, I'm essentially going to pick one of the five cards here on the main base and then assign that as my role. And I'm actually gonna become the leader of this role. Um, so let's say since we just pulled the warfare card out, we're gonna go ahead and pick warfare as our role. Now, again, this game's about synergy, right? So anytime that I pick a role, if I can match cards from my hand, as many symbols as I have, I'm gonna be able to increase the bonus I'm gonna get from this. Um, so I have one warfare card and it's going to allow us to collect a fighter or attack a planet. Since we don't have any fighters right now, there's no sense in attacking. So we're going to collect a planet, uh, sorry, a fighter. And then we're going to collect another fighter because uh, of the second card we played. And it actually has a leader bonus that says if we're the leader, we're going to collect an additional fighter. So we're going to collect three fighters on this turn. Just like that. You're actually probably not going to be able to see them on... Well, maybe on the actual camera, but there they are. So from here, every opponent is going to be able to do one of two things. They can either descent and essentially not follow this role, and they're going to be able to draw a card from their deck then, or they're going to follow, and they're going to piggyback and play as many of these types of cards that they have in their hand. So if I have my opponent to my, across the table from me has three uh, warfare cards, they're going to be able to play all three of those and get three fighters back. Now, following has its advantages and it has its disadvantages. When I follow, I'm essentially lessening my hand from my turn. Um, when I descent, I get to essentially bring another card from my deck and put it into my hand. Um, we'll get more on following and descenting here in a little bit. So the next phase is the cleanup phase. We're going to take these two cards, trash them in our discard here. And then we're going to proceed to the cleanup phase. And in the cleanup phase, I actually get to pick any number of cards that I want to, which is going to be these three, actually. And we're going to draw back up to five cards. Now, you only reconcile your hand during the cleanup phase. So if you play cards that allow you to go past your hand limit, you're going to actually be able to keep those until the end of your turn. So that's actually where following can be beneficial for you or not. Um, if I play all of my hand during the follow phase and I don't have any actions or any role, I can only pick a role and I can't boost it at all. So it's going to maybe limit some of my action that I'll be able to do there. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and fast forward and go to my next turn. So my, my the player uh, next to me just uh, went, and let's actually say I didn't follow his role. He picked survey, he got some planets. I didn't do that, and instead I'm going to descent and I'm going to pick the last card in my hand and put it in there. And then now I'm gonna go to the uh, my next roll phase, essentially. Um, and what I'm gonna do is actually uh, going to be to uh, do the warfare, I'm sorry, I'm gonna use the warfare action, which says attack planet or collect a fighter. So I'm actually gonna discard this and I'm going to attack this planet with two of these ships here. And going to be able to flip that card over so this is going to then again reveal the card in the base and then here i'm going to be able to then proceed to my roll phase and on my roll phase i'm going to choose survey and i'm going to lay down these two more survey cards so when i survey i'm actually going to take a look at the number of planets here according to how much my boosted value is which in this case is going to be three minus one and then I'm going to plus one because I'm the leader. Um, again, you're the leader on your roll phase. Um, so I'm going to essentially be able to get three cards from the planets and pick the one that I want the most. So let's take a look at the planet cards now. So here we go. One, two, three. We'll put the rest back here. And then we'll see here. Now we've got one metallic planet out already. Um, this planet actually has a survey marker here. Now certain planets here are going to have the different roles emblems here. If they do, that means they, in all intents and purposes, count as one of those cards anytime you're determining bonuses. So in that last example, I played uh, three uh, survey cards. If I had this out in play, I'd essentially have a power of four on my survey because it's going to make it. Remember, all planets are played face down, and you're not going to be able to flip this over until you meet either the warfare or the cost to colonize it. Um, lastly, all of these cards produce a resource. Um, so here is one for 
um, survey, here's one for trade, and then one finally for colonize. So these are all pretty good cards. Let's take a look at the point values here to see which of any of them stand out. And they're all value three. So these are pretty even. Uh, since I already have a metallic planet, I'm gonna go ahead and choose this one and I'll put it down in my empire just like that. So it's gonna remain there until I have the ability to either take it over or colonize it. The other two cards that we don't pick are actually going to be discarded in the planet discard pile. Quick correction, when I attacked this planet here, these, these fighters aren't gonna remain in my bay. They're actually gonna go back to the supply. So it's gonna make sure that I can't just overwhelm my opponent so quickly with just being able to focus on warfare. So now I have one fighter in my supply. I have a, a discard pile that I'm gonna to need to shuffle in order to get uh, the rest of my hand up. So you get kind of a general idea of how the game is played from just those sample couple of turns. There's one thing we really haven't talked about yet, and that's the advanced technology cards. Now, all of these are going to focus kind of in the same thing, and they're based upon the three different planets. We have a stack for fertile planets. We have a stack for the metal planet, metallic planets, and then one for the advanced planets. Now, depending on the number of planets I have and the number of research I play, I could potentially buy additional technologies, uh, basically advanced cards to go into my hand. Let's take a look at some of the botanic metallic technologies. Okay, so here is gonna be the name of the card, what it actually focuses on. So you can see these are dual cards. They're gonna focus on both survey and trade. It's gonna cost three research points and I'm gonna to have to have at least one metallic planet in my empire before I'm gonna be able to claim this card. Here's one for approved trade, improved research, and they see these all kind of, you're gonna have six that are basically the same thing of each different type. Reproduction, and then you're going to start getting to more of the advanced cards. Here's one called Survey Team, and this actually is two different surveys, and it has a special action. It's going to cost five research, and you're going to require two metallic planets before you can buy it. This says, take the top card of the planet deck and put it into your empire face down. So you are just essentially play the action again during your action phase and do that for free. Some of these cards are going to have an eminent domain background. Those designate the means you essentially put them straight into your deck. Some of them are going to have um, two sides, which are going to be these advanced things here. So here we've got a scorched earth policy, and this says negative two to your warfare cost when you attack a planet. Leave a fighter on it. That planet cannot store resources, and it's going to... Um, Essentially, you put this face up in your empire, it's actually going to cost a, or actually generate a, a number of victory points for you, and it has a backside. So you pick one side or the other. Uh, this card actually is really cool. It counts for a survey, a trade, or and a warfare all at once. Um, so you get to pick one of the rolls and get all three of those. Um, so very cool imperialism here allows you to uh, kind of hedge your bets into different areas. And then the big card here requires three metallic planets, seven research. This says you may play an additional card it, um, for its action effect during your action phase. So productivity, you get two actions that you can play. And then the back side of it says logistics. And again, same cost, same number of uh, planets required. And this says play the action and roll phases of your turn in any order. At the end of the game, take an additional turn. So once one of these once one of these decks is going to be um, dis, uh, diminished or ran out, uh, sorry, run out of it rather, or you run out of victory tokens, you're going to be able to. Um, the game is essentially over, and all players are going to get an equal number of turns unless you have logistics out, and then you'll get one additional turn more than everybody else. Pretty powerful card there. So this is essentially eminent domain. This is everything that it basically does in the in the core set. Again, this is a lot of fun. It's it's one of those games that's really easy to teach, like a lot of deck builders are. But it's also a deck builder that I don't find as boring as I find a lot of deck builders. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of the deck building genre. 
That being said, I think Eminent Domain is a big success, for me at least, um, because it, it gives, one, the rule booklet, again, like like every Tasty Minstrel rule booklet that I've read, is perfectly written. Um, it'll, you can just open it up, start on page one. It's very small, big fonts, lots of pictures. You just walk through the first sentence to the last, and you'll know how to play it. And there's not much confusion at all, um, which I find very, very cool. Um, there's not a lot of games out there, or a lot of game writers, rather, who can make a very good rule booklet like Tasty Minstrel can do. Um, it's easy to learn. It's really quick to play. Um, it says 45 minutes on the box. I think you can play probably in about 30 if you're playing two people. Anything more than that, probably add 10 to 15 minutes per player. Um, but, and again, it's, it's a lot of fun. You're going to be able to do a lot of different things. And the additional uh, feature of being able to go on my opponent's turn is going to keep you from that feeling of, well, we're essentially playing two solo games at the same time, and one of us is going to do better than the other, and that'll make us the winner. Like Dominion, for instance. Um, and I know I'm probably going to get some hate from the Dominion fans on that, but I'm sorry. That's just how I feel. Um, okay, well, that's it for Eminent Domain. We'll be right back with our final thoughts. That was Imminent Domain by Tasty Menstrual Games. As you can see, it's a, it's a space deck builder, but it plays actually really well, I think. Uh, I really like playing it with two players. I can only assume that when you add more players to it, it's going to be just as fun with the ability to follow or descent on every player's roll phase. It's going to really add for quite an interesting turn of events. The ability to actually do something on another player's uh, turn is uh, really makes this deck builder stand out to me. It's something that you don't see in a lot of deck builders, the ability to actually do something else. Um, a lot of people describe deck builders as essentially uh, multiplayer solitaire. It's essentially I'm playing my cards over and over and over again, you're playing your cards, and we never really interact. With Imminent Domain, it bridges that gap just a little bit. And uh, I really like the theme. I think Tasty Mitchell has designed another great rule book. I strongly recommend if you're into deck building games, check out Imminent Domain. Thank you so much for watching. As always, give this a thumbs up if you liked it. Subscribe if you haven't. And mostly, game on.